Welcome to the Yes Prep Virtual College Fair. My name is Jasmine. I'm going to serve as a facilitator for our session today. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping announcements. The first announcement, your camera and microphone are off so the panelists cannot see or hear you. Second announcement, you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom to type your questions to our presenters at any point throughout our session today. Third announcement, this is just one of a few different sessions that we're offering, so feel free to visit our registration site to sign up for additional sessions. And finally, you can access this recording by visiting the website on your screen, strivescan.com slash yesprep. With all that said, I want to go ahead and introduce our first presenters from Rice University. Good morning, everyone, um, and we're about to share the presentation. But in the meantime, uh, my name is Nelson Mendoza. Uh, I'm an admission officer at Rice. I'm also a Yes Prep alum. I graduated from Southeast campus many years ago, and I'm here joined by my colleague, Shanna. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you again. All right, so um, we're going to present and then we'll be happy to see any questions in the Q&A so we can jump right in. And at Rice, uh, we encourage academic flexibility. And so we offer uh, seven undergraduate schools of study where you can pursue a major. Uh, they include the School of Engineering, School of Natural Science, School of Humanities, School of Social Science, School of Music and the School of Architecture. And starting this year, you could pursue a business major at the School of Business. If you're thinking, I haven't really made up my mind on what to pursue, uh, you will actually have plenty of time at Rice. We're actually going to require you to explore through our flexible distribution requirements. Under those, you must take three classes in the humanities, three classes in the social sciences, and three classes in the applied sciences. Uh, we have many top one programs. We have the number one undergraduate program in architecture in the country and the number one undergraduate program in sport management uh, in the United States as well. Um, all of these by niche. Next slide, please. To um, elaborate on academics at Rice, uh, we love when our students create new knowledge and many of them do that through research. Around 70% of our students will conduct research while they're here. There are over 45 research centers, institutes and consortia where you can conduct such research in fields from biology at the Bioscience Research Collaborative, to policy at the Baker Institute and many other fields as well. Next slide. We have very prominent professors at Rice, Nobel Prize winners, teacher students, Guggenheim Fellows, Grammy Award winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, and many others. What's great is we are a small school. We only have about 4,000 undergraduate students. And so you will get a lot of access to your professors for mentorship, they might even host dinners at their homes. And so again, we have distinguished faculty, but also a lot of access uh, to, these, to these professors. Next slide. Um, and so I will mention briefly about student life and then I'll pass it off to Shanna. Um, at Rice, student life is highly noted. We, um, a core part of our student life experience is the residential college system. If you're thinking, what is a residential college? Well. The summer before your first year at Rice, you'll be randomly assigned to one of our 11 colleges. Every college has dorms, they have a beautiful courtyard, they have common rooms where you can relax with your friends. Some of them have serveries or they'll share a servery with another, which is like a cafeteria. Um, and so you will be randomly assigned and each college has its own traditions, its own spirit, its own rivalries with other colleges. And then finally, every college also has a magister who is a professor who lives in the college, usually in a house next to the college and they will create a sense of community. They usually move in with their, with their pets, with their babies, with their children. And so you might see children running in the courtyard uh, on the walk to class. And with that, I pass it off to Shannon. Awesome, thank you. So at ICE, we have over 300 clubs and organizations covering all different types of interests. It could be academic to volunteering. Uh, we have study abroad programs in all seven continents and our athletic teams do compete in NCAA Division I Conference USA. So we've got lots of student support at uh, Rice. And so I could go into a long talk about each one of these, but just to let you know, our first gen low income students, as well as all students have access to all of these supports. And so you're gonna have support from professionals, faculty, staff, alumni, and even other students. And so I highly recommend going to our Student Life website to learn more about each of these different departments. 
being in Houston beyond our hedges, there's so much opportunity. As you know, being from Houston, there's so many industries here. And so our students take advantage of being part of this community. And so our students um, could be going down the street to the NRG to go to the rodeo. They could be going, doing internships downtown. Just lots of different opportunities for students here in Houston, which is the fourth largest city in America. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about financial aid because I only have one minute left. Uh, so we really wanna make rice affordable for uh, not only low-income students, but middle-income families as well. And so by applying uh, for financial aid through the FAFSA and CSS profile, the rice investment is one of these uh, programs that can help make rice affordable. And so if you have questions about the rice investment, please reach out to us. We do meet 100% of unmet need. And as you can see here from the three different tiers, we do uh, have a really great program to help families afford rice. And to apply for merit scholarships, all you have to do is submit your admission application and approximately 20% of admitted students will be awarded some type of merit scholarship. So as you can see, our stats here, our students uh, receive excellent preparation while they're here at Rice. Uh, we have 35% um, of our students uh, going on to uh, pursue advanced degrees. 80% um, of our students are doing internships or research experience. And so I think this is really uh, uh, impressive stats for us. And um, I could go on and on about this, but really I wanna give you next steps because I know how it is here at Rice. You can't just uh, end uh, the classroom with something, you've gotta have your next steps. So please connect with us. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our presenters from Rice University. Our next presenter is from George Washington University. Hi there, and good morning, and thank you all for joining with us today. So my name is Ben Toll. I'm the Dean of Admissions here at the George Washington University. And and I think, you know, as you go through your college search, a lot of this is finding that institution that's going to provide you with the right opportunities. So we as an institution are located right in the heart of the nation's capital. So, you know, I'm standing on campus today, four blocks down the street on Pennsylvania Avenue is the White House. We're next door to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, across the street from the State Department. And this is the world that our students exist in every single day. Part of our educational experience is about not only you know, training you academically and letting you advance through your studies and become experts of your field, but it's also getting you out there into the city so you can see it in the real world. Um, we have a student body of about 10,000 or so students. Um, if you go into our career and internship database that we run, there's over 14,000 different postings on any given day. And so our students throughout their four years are going to be in a situation where they're going to not only, you know, go through their coursework, but more importantly, we think they're gonna do two to three internships so that you have the chance to try different things out, figure out what they're interested in, how do they build a professional network, learn how to interview, so that when it comes to graduation, you're ready to go out there into the world. Um, and being in DC, it's a city with tremendous opportunities and connections, right? So we have a Metro stop right on campus. So if you need to get to Capitol Hill, you need to get to NIH because you're doing research trials. Maybe you've got an uh, internship at the Pentagon. All that is, is, is very easy for you to be able to get around. Uh, when we look at the academic experience, we are an institution where you're going to apply directly to a school. Um, but what's important to know is that our students connect the dots between all of these different schools. Um, for example, in our, our business school, they actually require that every one of their students does a minor outside the business school, right? Because they want to be dynamic. They want to be able to think about things through different lenses. Um, as an institution, we simply exist because President George Washington one, there to be a university in the nation's capital to train the next generation of leaders. And so we think about that, about, again, not only do we provide the academic experience, but how do we develop those skill sets in you um, to be able to become those future leaders? How do we teach you to work with others? How do we teach you to work with students from all different academic disciplines, right? If you're on a group project and you've got students from engineering and students from journalism and students from public health, each of you thinks in different ways. And it's, it's important for someone to figure out how do I make that team function well together and how do I lead them through this process? Um, across the seven different schools, there's gonna be over 70 different majors. So you're gonna have a lot of different things to be able to choose from and find your passion while you're here. And we know, you know the idea of choosing a major right off the bat can be a little intimidating. And so it's important for us that you actually have the ability to switch from one school to another during your academic career as well. And I think, you know, and, and Rice is another great example of this, of these urban schools, um, 
that have all these opportunities, but sometimes it can be a fear that, oh, once you get out of class, everyone scatters. But instead, our student life is incredibly important, right? We have our students living on campus at least through junior year and then senior years are option because we want you to be a part of that thriving community of 10,000 students with 500 clubs and organizations, D1 athletics, community service groups. We want to be able to have you come to GW and put your passions into action. Um, and we find that our students really come together. I think one of the, the really nice things about college is that, you know, for most GW students, they're the only student from their high school starting in that freshman class. And so everyone starts with a clean slate and we all, you know, start that very first week building new relationships, building new friendships and creating a, a network of people around us. When it comes to the application process, you know, there's a lot of stuff on this slide. You know, the big one I want you to understand is, you know, our application process is rooted in your high school transcript. Um, you see that we've been test optional since 2015. So I know a lot of schools have gone test optional last year or two because of the pandemic, but this is something we've been doing for the last seven years or so. And so we have really good history of how to work with students and allow you to have a little bit more control over your application and how you're viewed in this, right? Because we see your application as a portfolio of different experiences. Um, and then when it comes to outcomes, right, our students, um, we actually just had graduation for the last two years, we've kind of been saving it up due to the pandemic. And so we just did it um, just two weekends ago and we, we graduated in the National Mall. And so it's one of our, probably our most important traditions that we do, but you see our students, they go off in a lot of different directions. You know, many are going off into the workforce. You know, they've built that resume, they've built those experiences and they're ready to make that next transition. About 20% going off to graduate school. That other activity one is a really interesting one. Um, we're one of the top providers of Peace Corps volunteers as well as Teach for America volunteers. And so if that's something you're interested in, there's gonna be a really strong community of students going forward. And you're gonna be able to have a support network as you go about. So with that, you know, I wanna thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for having an open mind and thinking about GW and I'll, I'll turn over to my next uh, colleague. Thanks, Ben. Our next presenter is from Rhodes College. Thank you very much and nice to meet you guys. My name is Caleb Fowler. I'm Senior Assistant Director of Mission at Rhodes. And I was born in Houston and raised in Central Texas and I went to Rhodes myself. So I understand the transition from uh, Texas to Memphis, and I got to tell you, I fell in love with it. But I'll tell you that Rhodes is a National Liberal Arts and Sciences institution of around 2,000 students, so a smaller type of institution, but one with a national reach, where you guys are feel like you're going to come into a campus where you're surrounded by ideas, some that you have encountered and others that are coming, coming from brand new places. Um, our students are becoming intellectually ready, leadership ready, and career and grad school ready so that they can step into the next phase of their lives and succeed. And so that's something we really want to see our students be able to do. Uh, they're doing so on the most beautiful campus in the country, as we have been named by Princeton Review. And so they're enjoying this beautiful atmosphere with collegiate Gothic architecture, where you feel like you are truly at home on the campus. Um, we have a three-year residential requirement, so you live on campus for the first three years. Uh, I lived on campus all four years, and I got to tell you, my first apartment was not as good as even my dorm room on campus, where you have stained glass windows in your dorm, two or three-minute walk from your best friends. That's stuff that you can really enjoy at a residential college like Rhodes. But within our academic context too, our students are, um, are really focused on the honor code for one. They're not sweating the little things like leaving their laptop out or a phone on the desk for a few hours at a time because they trust each other in the community. They're also doing so in a very personalized environment where they are able to engage with professors in small class sizes. Our average class size is about 12 to 14 students. And our student factor ratio is about nine to one. So you actually get to know your professors and they are professors teaching you, not TAs. They are people actually involved in your lives and helping you learn how to apply what you're learning in the classroom to your education beyond. We don't want students just to be focused on their education in the classroom. It's not just schooling. Um, you don't just get an education. We want you guys to dive into the things that you're excited about. Um, you do not have to declare your major until sophomore spring. So as many of you are likely seniors, you have two plus years to figure it out right now to figure out your major. You would just apply to Rhodes generally and be able to discover alongside faculty mentors, someone assigned to you, in fact, how you want to pursue your academic journey. And that's helped students to be able to decide what they really want to go into. You don't have to figure out right now what career path you want to step into. You just need to decide what kind of skills do I want to gain during my time in college? And that's something students are very eager to do. Uh, 
Within the campus community too, we have a hundred different clubs and organizations. Again, I mentioned we want you to be leadership ready. That doesn't mean you gotta be the captain of every single club or the top dog in whatever you're doing. It means that we want you guys to be able to step into roles and do well in that, whatever it is. Uh, we have a hundred different clubs and organizations on campus. You're gonna be gathered around kind of like you see here uh, where you're able to stop by a table and sign up for the beekeeping club or the Rose radio program, whatever. I saw we had a DJ in the group. Uh, we want you guys to feel like you can join clubs that are going to make you feel comfortable, but also those that are gonna challenge you, help you grow. That is part of the collegiate experience at Rhodes too. But we also do that where we are sending students out into the world, uh, whether that's through internships, research, or study abroad. We wanna see students, begin bringing their classroom experience out into the larger community. So about 80% of our students do internships. They can do that because they're doing it in the city of Memphis, Tennessee. You're not having to go back home to Houston to do an internship during the summer. You can do it during the school year. This could be a fourth class for you. You don't have to feel like you are just confined to doing this kind of test run for a job during the summers. Uh, we also have students doing research on campus as well as off campus, places like St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, but every single professor at Rhodes does research and that's not just in the lab sciences. We want students to feel like even if you are a history student, which I was, you could still be doing research to make sure you are still understanding the material uh, very well. But you can be doing research at places like St. Jude, as I mentioned before, where um, our students are engaged with some people trying to solve childhood cancer. We are the only undergraduate institution in the country to have a formal research partnership with them. So that's special. And then about 70, 75% of our students study abroad or study away. And you guys can have the chance to be on a park bench in Paris. And that's your job for the day. That's what you're supposed to do. That is really, really cool. So we want students to be able to engage with that. We have about 400 different options for you guys to be able to do that. Beyond that too, we think the students are made career and grad school ready by just being in the city of Memphis. It's about the 28th largest city in the country. What's also nice about Rhodes is that we are firmly in the city. We're not on the outside of that. Rhodes is right here in Midtown Memphis, um, where we are a 10 minute drive, nine if you're going fast, to downtown where you can enjoy Grizzlies games for $5 because Rhodes will help subsidize tickets or go to Broadway shows or from theater or just engage with the community um, just within a 10 minute drive. I know coming from Texas, the closest drive I had on any given day was about 15 minutes. I don't really drive further than 15 minutes away from Rhodes during my time in Memphis because you don't have to. You can engage with things in Midtown, things like the Levitt Shell, which this is in fact a 12 minute walk from campus. It's where Elvis plays the very first paid show. You guys can do that as students. Memphis is accessible, not just low traffic, which we don't really have traffic, but it's also a place where you guys as Rhodes students can get to know leaders in the community. I'll tell you that I got to know the CEO of St. Jude when I was at Rhodes and I didn't even do research with them. You guys can have that opportunity because people are coming to Rhodes to connect with students. And then when you go out into the city of Memphis, you are better related to all of those too. Um, beyond that too, we wanna to emphasize that you guys have help. So um, when you apply to Rhodes, you're gonna be considered as your whole application. I would encourage you guys to apply um, earlier in the deadline process because the Rhodes will meet your full need as impact scholars. So I recommend applying early. Uh, but it's such a nice pleasure to be able to talk with you guys today. So please feel free to reach out to me if I can do anything to help you guys. Again, I am the rep. I'm the one actually reading applications too. So I am looking forward to getting to know each of you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Caleb. Our next presenter is from McAllister College. Good morning. Thank you for having me. My name is Veronica Zapata. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an admissions officer and first year support coordinator at McAllister College. So we'll get started. McAllister is located in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we're one of the few characteristics most unique about us is that we're one of very few liberal arts colleges in the country located in an urban area. Our campus sits about four miles west from downtown St. Paul and six miles east from downtown Minneapolis. Although our student body is small, we have about 2,100 students on campus. There are 3.5 million people in the Twin Cities metro area. Our students have access to over 200 internship sites within an eight mile radius of campus, and the International Airport is only five miles away, so about a 15 minute car ride. And They're Veronica, also, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. We are not able to uh, see your screen here. I'm so sorry about that. I Can you see it now? We're No, we're not able to. Not oh, I it keeps saying it's sharing, but. What about now? 
unfortunately, no. If you want, we can come back to you. Sure, yeah, helpful. it works during the practice. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's totally fine. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move to Oberlin and, and Meg Callister will be our last presenter. Okay, can you guys see my screen? We can, Leah. Okay, great. Um, hi, my name's Leah. I'm from Oberlin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an admissions counselor here. Um, like my colleagues, I'm the rep, so I will be the one reading your applications. Um, I'm also an OB. I'm an alum. Um, I, I studied politics while I was here. Um, yeah, so to get right into it, Oberlin is a small liberal arts school about 40 miles south of Cleveland, Ohio. It's in the Northeastern area. Um, we are a big, big, small school. So we actually have a pretty big um, population for a small liberal arts school. Uh, we're about 3000 students split between two divisions. One is the College of Arts and Sciences and the other is the conservatory, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Because we're a little bit bigger on the bigger side, um, we have, many, many opportunities for our students on campus. Um, we offer over a thousand courses every semester. We have over 500 concerts per year, which averages out to three or four a day. We like to say that the first thing you learn at Oberlin is how to say no, because you can't possibly do everything in one day. Um, we have over 200 student organizations. Um, we offer 21 division three sports teams, as well as club sports and intramurals mixed in there. We have a brand new health and wellness center that opened up just in 2018 where we offer uh, free classes and free use of the gym for our students and faculty. Um, we have seven literary or, uh, publications that are run by students, including that we run the Oberlin Review, which is the town's newspaper. Um, so there's a lot going on um, in terms of activity at Oberlin. We're also an incredibly diverse campus. We meet 100% of need based of demonstrated need, meaning that we have a huge diversity of students from different economic backgrounds, um, as well as geographically, we're um, really diverse. We generally get about 48 to 49 states. We occasionally miss out on the Dakotas, but we have um, all the others we represent often. About 12% of our campus are international students. We represent over 40 countries, um, but we're also, we also benefit from having the small liberal arts school feel. Um, our student to faculty ratio is about 11 to one and our average class size is around 15, meaning that you'll get to know your professors really well. Um, we're undergraduate only, so you'll get to, you'll not be competing with students with three or four more years experience than you for research opportunities. Um, so about two thirds of our students are engaged in research. Uh, yeah, so to talk a little bit more about where we, are. Um, like I said, we're about 40 miles south of Cleveland. That's a 40 minute drive. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, California myself. So driving the same number of minutes as miles was a new experience for me. Um, but Cleveland is a very exciting city in itself. Um, it's the second largest theater district outside of New York. It's the first stop for Broadway shows um, as soon as they get on the road. We have three major sports teams, um, art museums, concert halls, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, all of these things are available to you in Cleveland, um, which is not difficult to get to. Um, that said, we do have a small town feel. The college was actually founded in the same year as the town, 1833. And so we're very connected with our community. Um, we have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of students work in town. We have really good relationships with our business, our local businesses. Um, yeah. Um, talk about the academic experience of Oberlin. We like to emphasize the engaged liberal arts, meaning that you'll get these um, experiences in a lot of different fields. Um, we require that you uh, kind of shop around, um, take classes in three different areas of the humanities, social sciences, and natural science and math. So you will necessarily come out of Oberlin with experiences in a lot of different fields and be able to apply those to your career prospects, your internships, um, to whatever you do after Oberlin and, or outside of Oberlin. We also really emphasize hands-on learning, um, getting your, in the field, maybe working in the wetlands around us with your biology classes or going to our local art museum, um, which is the Allen. It was recently mentioned as one of the most influential college art museums by the New York Times. Um, 
we work with the Allen a lot um, as the third largest art collection of any college. Um, we also have on campus the, um, I mentioned that we have the Conservatory of Music. Um, if any of you are interested in going through, of, in attending a conservatory, sorry, um, it's a study where you will be with learning about classical music or jazz music. Um, students who graduate from the con have degrees in things like flute performance or accompaniment or conducting. Um, we, because of the conservatory, we have a really like robust um, musical culture on campus. Uh, like I said, we have over 500 concerts that's inclusive of the conservatory recitals and performers like Yo-Yo Ma, who was recently on campus, but it's also inclusive of more contemporary performers who come because of our, uh, because of the college's prestige and the conservatory's prestige. Um, we are the longest running conservatory in the country. Um, we also are the only conservatory outside besides Juilliard to receive the Presidential Medal of the Arts. Um, so the students who go here are really like world-class musicians and we benefit from not only their talent, but from the draw that they have on guest performers. Um, yeah, I just have a couple more minutes. So I just wanna say, um, I just wanna emphasize that Oberlin is, um, we are a little bit more removed from the urban setting than some of my um, colleagues institutions here. Um, but people aren't really leaving campus. We have so much happening that in my time at Oberlin, I only went into Cleveland maybe 15 times. Um, people like to stay, people don't like to go home for the weekend. Um, Oberlin really is a, a community that people like to invest in and come back to. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll turn it over to my next colleague. Thanks guys. Thanks, Leah. Our next presenter is from Whitman College. Okay, can everyone see my screen? We can, Lily. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Lily Painter. I am a rep from Whitman College. Originally, my colleague, Lisbeth Yanis Macias was going to present because she is the regional for Texas. Um, however, I am here instead. She is currently on a trip. So I'll be telling you all a little bit about Whitman today. So I would just like to start off by highlighting some of who our students are and some of the opportunities that arise for them. So a big theme and thing that we are proud of at Whitman is that our students are leaders. And this comes in many, many different forms and avenues. So there's not one correct way to be a leader. There's not one profile of a leader that we are looking for, but we notice that students who come to Whitman really get involved. And kind of to echo some of the previous presenters' thoughts, there are so many things to do here that students really they have so many opportunities, but we do also like to tell them to, it's okay to say no, you can kind of focus in on things that you are really passionate about. And some of the ways that students do this is we have a lot of students really involved in being resident assistants in being student academic advisors. And both of those positions are created to aid in welcoming first years to college to really getting them on their feet and feeling supported in that space. We also have students who are really engaged in the classroom setting, who will bring a lot to the table, who will research alongside their professors, as well as do a lot of different types of internships. And one really big thing that I like to point out is we have a power and privilege symposium every year. And this is really cool because it is completely student run. So these students are organizing it, putting it on, reaching out to speakers, making sure that everything is going according to plan. And with our Power and Privilege Symposium, the idea behind that is that every spring there is a day without classes where we will have it open to all students, staff and faculty, and speakers will come in, there will be activities. We will address topics such as racism, equity, social justice, and other very incredibly relevant things to our situations today and especially in the world right now. For example, in 2019, we had Angela Davis come in and speak to us. So although COVID has put a little bit of a stop to that in-person aspect, we are hoping to be restarting that again soon. 
However, our students also get to build good community. So not only are they leading and bettering themselves and working on themselves, they're also supporting their peers and being supported by the staff and faculty at Whitman. So some of the ways we do this that I think are important to point out are we have a student engagement center on campus. Their goal is really the future success of the graduates here. And so they are really involved in getting students connected to Walla Walla's community. So we do not want to be just a Whitman bubble. We would like our students to get out into the community and be involved. The Student Engagement Center also helps with internships. It also helps create cover letters and craft resumes. So they really do have the future interests of all Whitman students in mind. And that resource is also available to students after they graduate. We also are very small. So with about 1500 students and a nine to one student to faculty ratio, we are really able to make the classroom space more intimate and where students can connect. So we are very discussion based because of the liberal arts style of our learning. And so students will learn to be comfortable sharing ideas as well as stepping back and listening. And in that classroom setting, they will connect one on one with professors as well as other peers. And very often the professors here at Whitman are mentors to our students, both academically as well as just outside of that sphere, as well as just being an adult and an older person that the students can come to. Finally, we do have over 120 student organizations. That includes our sports teams down to our affinity clubs to environmental justice groups, for example. And so again, our students are really involved. They lead those clubs, they put them together, and that just circles us back to ways that they are able to lead and build community among each other. However, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about where we are. We are also in a quite a rural place. Southeastern Washington is really accessible to the outdoors and outdoor programs. And so that is something that we take advantage of and we're very proud of being able to utilize. We are about 45 minutes from the Blue Mountains. We are 30 minutes to an hour and a half from some major rivers like the Columbia River Gorge and the Snake River. These spaces all offer great opportunities to go hiking, whitewater rafting, kayaking, rock climbing, you name it. And we have an outdoor program in which we are able to give $150 per year to every single student to use on those programs. So that is one way that we try to make our passion for the outdoors more equitable and accessible to all students. We also do have an airport about five minutes from campus. And I like to point that out because Walla Walla is very small. It's not expected we would have an airport, but it's there for the students that come in from other states and internationally. Finally, I'd like to end with a new program that we are rolling out. It's our early financial aid guarantee. We are actually one of only two colleges in the states who do this at the moment. And you can get your minimum estimate on scholarship, both need-based and merit-based before you apply to us. So you can go on our website and apply there. And then finally, here is my colleague's contact. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Our next presenter is from McAllister College. All right, let's try this again. Hopefully it works this time. Can you see the screen? Unfortunately, we cannot. I'm sorry, Veronica. All right, let me try something different or not. Uh, okay, how about now? Can you see the screen? Not yet. Not yet. Um, maybe we can, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag on Zoom. Okay, let's try. I'll just leave it there for a while then. Is anything popping up? Not yet, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's weird because the little green thing that typically happens is not popping up either. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not Sure. I think if you want to go ahead and share the information you have. 
Yeah, I think Sorry that would be that. fine. That's totally okay. I can paint everyone a picture. Um, I'm so sorry about that, everyone. It was working earlier, so technology. Um, I'm still Veronica. I still use she, her pronouns. Um, admissions officer, first year support coordinator. I will be reading your application if you apply to McAllister. I graduated from McAllister in 2019. Um, so as I was saying a little bit earlier, we are located in St. Paul, Minnesota in the Twin Cities. And one of the characteristics most unique about us is that we are one of very few liberal arts colleges in the country located in an urban area. Our campus sits about four miles west of downtown St. Paul, six miles east of downtown Minneapolis. And although we have a small student body, about 2,100 students, there are 3.5 million people in the Twin Cities metro area. So our students have access to over 200 internship sites within an eight mile radius of campus. The international airport is five miles away, about a 15 minute car ride. And there are 16 Fortune 500 companies in the Twin Cities, including Target and 3M. So as you can tell, the Twin Cities really have a lot to offer. We have some of the biggest and most reputable medical and scientific research facilities in the region, a vibrant artistic scene, and a full cohort of professional sports organizations. Allianz Field, home to the Minnesota United FC, is only a few blocks away from Mac for any soccer fans out there. And I'm sure you've all heard of Lizzo at this point. She began her career right here in the Twin Cities. As you can tell, they aren't just for jobs, internships, and research opportunities. The Twin Cities can really be a great outlet for exploring concerts, cultural organizations, art museums, restaurants, bike trails, and everything else under the sun, or in a few weeks, maybe a month from now, the snow. Whenever the Mac bubble begins to feel a bit too small, students can go find anything they could possibly want within 30 minutes on public transportation. Um, on this slide, you would see some of our students carrying flags. We are a mission-driven institution, and we are grounded in our values of academic excellence, multiculturalism, internationalism, and service society. Generally, 35% of our US students identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, so BIPOC for short. And in the incoming class of 2024, that number rose to 41%. Additionally, about 18% of our incoming MAC students were the first in their families to earn a four-year college degree. Our LGBTQ plus community on campus is also vibrant. So we do have a long-standing and enduring commitment to global citizenship that traces back to the mid 1900s and is represented by the fact that we've flown the UN flag on our central flagpole since 1950. Currently 15% of our student body is international and about 25% of our students hold citizenship of a country other than the United States. There are 98 different countries represented on campus and our student body collectively speaks 75 different languages. We don't require volunteer hours because that would be oxymoronic to have mandatory volunteering. But what's incredible is that our students desire to get involved in our community. About 90% of recent McAllister graduates reported doing some kind of civic engagement work or volunteering during their time at Mac. In addition, there are 192 community partners located within just five miles of campus and 61 classes in over 20 departments that have a civic engagement component. So that means that your class meets outside of the classroom in the Twin Cities throughout the academic semester. On this slide, you would see um, our general distribution requirements, which I will definitely talk about a little bit. So our general distribution requirements are ultimately rooted in preparing our graduates to live the mission of the college. In the spirit of a liberal arts and sciences education, we do ask our students to dabble and take a little bit of everything, but we also require a second language fluency and courses emphasizing both internationalism and US identities and differences with the understanding that students in any course of study will leave McAllister more well-rounded, empathetic, and prepared to add value across a wide variety of platforms. We have 39 majors on campus, 40 minors, and 10 academic concentrations. Our academic concentrations highlight the unique interests of our students, faculty, and staff, and are interdisciplinary by design. Some of the most popular concentrations on our campus include human rights and humanitarianism, community and global health, and urban studies. On this slide, you would just see a list, so you're not missing out on much. Um, the list uh, really is about some of the on-campus departments uh, programs that offer support to students. So for example, we have the Leo Tatsuzuki Center and the Gender and Sexuality Resource Centers located within the, within the Department of Multicultural Life that offer a number of signature programs. So a few examples here, we have the Identity Collectives, which help recognize the multiple and intersecting identities we all carry and the importance of a supportive community as we explore our privileged and marginalized identities. We also have Mosaic, which is short for mentoring opportunities, 
for students across identity and culture, which provides peer mentorship for first year students who identify as students of color, indigenous students, LGBTQIA+, and first generation to college students. Uh, we also have Bridges and Barriers that focuses on providing workshops and community events, specifically for first generation students. And some of the workshops they hosted last year included pursuing a well-balanced life and getting your financial assets together. Uh, last year, the Department of Multicultural Life also offered pop workshops on topics of power, oppression, and privilege. Lastly, each year, 12 students from our incoming class are selected for the Bonner Community Scholars Program. And Bonner is a four-year civic engagement program providing leadership, programming, academic support, and engagement opportunities and a social network. So my last slide, you would just see some more words. So again, not missing out on much. Luckily, uh, we are a common application school. We no longer have an application fee. It's totally free to apply to McAllister. And we're also permanently test optional. Um, we have an early action round, two early decision rounds, regular decision, and we're also a QuestBridge partner school. So um, we meet 100% of demonstrate, demonstrate a need for all admitted students. We also provide provide merit scholarships. About half of our incoming students receive an academic merit scholarship. There is no additional application for those scholarships. So that is basically McAllister in a nutshell. I am so sorry you didn't get to see the slides, but I'm thankful that you were listening. Thank you, Veronica, for sharing in the midst of some, some Zoom issues. We really appreciate it. So that concludes the presentation portion of our session for today. But now we're gonna to transition to our q and I wanna encourage all of our presenters to return. Feel free to turn on your camera and I will pose a question to the group. Our presenters will respond to the question in the order in which they present it. So I saw a really great question in the Q&A. Um, essentially the question stated, um, what is the diversity like at your school and what are the supports available for first-generation college students? So we'll start with Rice. I can jump in for this one, Shanna. <laughs> um, so uh, I put a link in the Q&A. Uh, we have a class profile that you can take a look at and that class profile is about our first year group of students. And so you'll see it's very diverse and it represents, it's fairly similar to our overall undergraduate student body. Um, so a lot of diversity um, for many students from many backgrounds. In terms of academic supports, uh, Shanna talked a bit about this in the presentation, but the Student Success Initiatives Office, they provide support to um, any student who wants personal or academic support, but they particularly focus on what we call, um, uh, who we call our FLY students, uh, first gen um, low income students. So appointments, workshops, you can knock on their door, they have a physical office, they're super welcoming and friendly, and so they can be there available. And I think we were going in the order that we presented, so I can't remember who. No problem. So I'll pick it up from there for GW. Um, so at GW, over 20% of our students are of BIPOC backgrounds, 14% are first generation. Our, uh, the university president is actually a first generation college student himself, um, as well as his wife. And so they actually host our first generation students to their house at the beginning of semester to help make sure that they're forming connections, right? Um, you know, and, and we've got a whole team of students or team of staff members who will be working with you um, to, you know, both provide that support in terms of your academics, uh, but at the same time, helping you to build a community, right? And I think one of the, the best parts of college is who you choose to surround yourself by um, and with and, and making sure you have those connections. So I'm next. Uh, Rhodes, around 31% of the whole student body are either multicultural students or international students. Um, every student, regardless of whether you walk in Rhodes as a first gen student or fifth gen, it's all new to you. Um, your first day is going to feel similar. You don't know what's coming and that's okay. Uh, so each student is going to be part of our first year experience program. We're going to be um, led along by faculty, staff, and other uh, upperclassmen students to adjust to college and the changes that can be there. Uh, and that'll last the first semester. So you feel like you have a cohort walking in who can help you make sure that you are settling in well. Um, so those are some of the supports that we offer for students. Yeah, I talked a little bit about our diversity on campus. We are about 26% POC, 12% um, international, uh, geographically diverse, as I said, and um, diverse in terms of our economic backgrounds. Um, in terms of support for our um, 
uh, first generation students. Our first gen students are assigned a specific first gen advisor when they get to campus who they'll be required to meet with through their first year and for longer if they want to. Um, but that's just additionally, that's an additional advice that you get um, with your peer mentor and your faculty advisor um, just to support you in the specific uh, challenges that you face as a first gen student. Yeah, so at Whitman, we are about 11% international. We are about 26% POC at the moment. And also some of the supports that we offer in terms of that ratio. One thing that we do is we do a summer fly-in orientation program before school starts for a lot of our first generation as well as POC and Pell Grant qualifying students. And so again, we kind of have the idea of having a cohort where people will look like you or maybe have had similar experiences to you coming in. And then beyond that, we also have a lot of affinity groups and clubs where people are able to connect with those who again, may have similar experiences to them and may make them feel more at home. We also, of course, do have advisors who are very invested in every student's life. So before a student gets on campus, you're paired with an advisor. Yeah, and I see that we're running short on time. So I did share a lot of these numbers during my presentation, about 35% BIPOC, 15% international, a quarter hold citizenship of a country other than the US. Our Department of Multicultural Life hosts a lot of the programming for first gen BIPOC LGBTQIA plus students, and we also have affinity groups and orgs on campus focusing on identity. So all of this information is available on our website. I just don't want to um, make you all stay extra minutes if we're running low on time. Thank you all. I know that there are a lot of questions in the Q&A that we were unable to respond to, but I would encourage all of our attendees to reach out to the admissions reps uh, for the schools that you're interested in. With that said, we are approaching the end of our college fair for today, but I do have a few closing announcements. As you exit from this session, a Zoom survey will appear. It's approximately five questions or so, but please complete the survey. It's extremely helpful as we aim to improve our virtual college fair offerings in the future. Also wanna remind you to visit our registration site to sign up for additional sessions. And then finally, you can access this recording by visiting the website on your screen. I wanna thank all of our amazing presenters for joining us, but thank you also to our attendees. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.